For those who don't know, this is AI Gigabrain Andre Kapathi, who, among other things, spent half a decade serving as the director of artificial intelligence at Tesla, heading up their autopilot slash Tesla vision efforts. In a recent podcast, he was asked why self-driving cars took so long and shared some thoughts as to how soon until they're at massive scale. Leading self-driving from 2017 to 2022, and then you firsthand saw this progress from we went from cool demos to now thousands of cars out there actually autonomously doing drives. Why did that take a decade? Like, mm-hmm. what was happening through that time? Yeah. Uh, so I would say one thing I will almost instantly also push back on is this is not even near done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in a bunch of ways that I'm going to mm-hmm. get to. I do think that uh, self-driving is very interesting because uh, it's definitely like where I get a lot of my intuitions because I spent five years mm-hmm. on it. Um, and it has this entire history where actually the first demos of self-driving go all the way to 1980s. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can see a demo from CMU in 1986. There's a truck that's driving itself on roads. Um but okay, fast forward. I think when I was joining Tesla, I had um, I had a very early uh, demo of a uh, Waymo, and it basically gave me a perfect drive uh, in 2000, 2014 or something mm. like that. So perfect Waymo drive a decade ago. Uh, gave took us around Palo Alto and so on yeah. because I had a friend who worked there, um, and I thought it was like very close, and then still took a long time. And I do think that some there's for some kinds of um, tasks and jobs and so on, uh, the, there's a very large demo to product gap where the demo is very easy, but the product is very hard. Um, and it's especially the case in cases like self-driving where uh, the uh, the cost of failure is too high, right? have to jump in here because this may, in fact, likely will be the most important point that Andre makes about self-driving vehicles, a point I've made many times in the past. The stakes are so high when it comes to multi-ton death machines on wheels, the stakes are literal, in some cases, life and death. I mean, that's the ultimate price to pay, right? One mistake, somebody dies, multiple people die. It does not get worse than that. There's such incredible asymmetrical risk reward here. that This technology needs to be ultra cautiously rolled out. And the other factor is even if per mile self-driving vehicles are significantly safer then human-driven vehicles, as measured by, let's say, for example, fatalities per miles driven, most people seem to intuitively know that a fatality involving a self-driving vehicle, if it's at fault, is going to seem many, many times worse than a fatality due to a human error, which, by the way, counts for roughly a million or so people dying every single year on public roads globally. And, of course, the media shitstorm that will follow fatalities or other incidents, self-driving vehicles, you know it's coming. So the point... Those wishing to scale self-driving vehicles are encumbered by the fact that they are playing the highest stakes game possible. At the very top of the list of consequences that you don't want are fatalities. But below that, self-driving vehicles also are risking causing permanent injuries, disabilities. Put together, it's inevitable that we'll see very slow, ultra-cautious rollout of this technology. Because you can't move fast and break things when it comes to life and death. As robotaxi fleets begin to scale globally, I think a lot of people will not realize this. In many cases, the constraining factor won't be the actual capability of the software, but the extreme paranoia and hyper-cautious nature of the company rolling their product out. In most cases, especially in the case of Tesla, who we know, their number one priority, always safety. Don't believe me? Look at the crash result test for every vehicle they ever produced, motherfuckers. It'll be the companies themselves, in particular Tesla, more so than regulators who are holding back rapid scale. In other words, I suspect, and I've said this many times going back a number of years, Tesla is much more likely to get regulatory approval by dumping mountains of data, incidents per mile, collisions, blah, 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 on regulators' desks, which will then be compared to human rates of collisions, casualties, injuries, and so on. And Tesla will be proving their software, FSD, is many times, not percent, times safer than human drivers, yet still... Tesla themselves are going to be the one pumping the brakes a little bit, going, you know what, let's just be absolutely fucking lutely certain here. In other words, in short, I don't think it's going to be regulators so much that are holding back Tesla in the next few years, but Tesla themselves holding themselves to an even higher standard of safety. Just remember, there's no undo button when shit hits the fan and a multi-thousand ton death machine 
is involved in the collision. Many in the, many industries, tasks and jobs maybe don't have that property. But when you do have that property, that definitely increases the timelines. I do think that, for example, in software engineering, I do actually think that that property does exist. I think for a lot of vibe coding, it doesn't. But I think if you're writing actual production-grade code, I think that property should exist because any kind of mistake actually leads to a security vulnerability or something like that. And millions and hundreds of millions of people's uh, personal social security numbers, etc., get leaked or something like that. And so I, I do think that it is a case that in software, people should be careful. Um, Kind of like in self-driving, um, like in self-driving, if you if it, things go wrong, you might get injury. In um, I guess there's worse outcomes, but I guess in in software, I almost feel like it's almost unbounded how terrible some things could be. <laughs> uh, so I do think that they share that property, and then I think basically what takes the long amount of time and the way to think about it is that it's a march of nines, and every single nine is a constant amount of work. So every single nine is the same amount of work. So when you get a demo and something works ninety percent of the time, that's just uh, that's just uh, what the first nine. And then you need the second nine and third nine, fourth nine, fifth nine. And while I was at Tesla for, was it five years or so, I think we went through maybe three nines, or two nines, I don't know what it is, you know. But like multiple nines of iteration, there's still more nines to go. And so that's why these things take, take so long. Um, and so it's definitely formative for me, like seeing something that was a demo. I'm un very unimpressed by demos. Um, so whenever I see demos of anything, I'm extremely unimpressed by that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it works better if you can... Um, if it's a demo that someone cooked up and is just showing you, it's worst. If you can interact with it, it's a bit better. But even then, you're not done. You need actual product. It's going to face all these challenges in when it comes in contact with reality and all these different pockets of behavior that need patching. And so I think we're going to see all that stuff play out. It's a march of nines. Each nine is constant. Uh, demos are encouraging. Still a huge amount of work to do. Uh, I do think it is a um, kind of a critical safety domain, unless you're doing vibe coding, which is all nice and fun and, and so on. And... Uh, so that's why I think this also enforced my timelines from that perspective. Mm. Th th that's that's very interesting to hear you say that the sort of safety guarantees you need from software are actually not dissimilar to self-driving because yeah. what people will often say is that self-driving took so long because the cost of failure is so high. Mm. Like a human makes a mistake on average every 400,000 miles or every seven mm. years. And if you had to release a coding agent that couldn't make a mistake for at least seven years, it would be much harder to deploy but I guess your point is that if you made a catastrophic coding mistake, like yeah. breaking some important system every seven years, very easy to do. <laughs> and in fact, in terms of sort of wall clock time, it much it would be much less than seven years because you're like constantly outputting code like that, yep. right? So it's like per tokens, you, or in terms of tokens, it would be seven years. But in terms of wall clock time, it yeah, would be pretty close. it's a much harder problem. I mean, self driving is just one of thousands of things that people do. Yeah. It's almost like a single vertical, I suppose. Um, whereas when we're talking about general software engineering, it's even more. There's more surface area. There's another. Another uh, objection people make to that analogy, mm -hmm. which is that with self-driving, what took a big fraction of that time was solving the problem of building basic, uh, having basic perception that's mm -hmm. robust and building representations and having a model that has some common sense so it can generalize to when it sees something that's slightly out of distribution. If somebody's waving down the road this way, you don't need to train for it. The thing will uh, have some understanding of how to respond to something like that. Mm -hmm. And these are things we're getting for free with LLMs or VLMs today. So we don't have to solve these very basic representation problems. And so now deploying AIs across different domains will sort of be like deploying a self-driving car with current models to a different city, which is hard, but not like a 10-year-long task. Mm. Yeah, basically, I'm not 100% sure if I fully agree with that. I don't know that we're how much we're getting for free. And I still think there's like a lot of gaps in understanding in what we are getting. Um, I mean, we're definitely getting more generalizable intelligence in a single entity, uh, whereas uh, self-driving is a very special purpose task that requires, in some sense, building a special purpose task is maybe even harder in a certain sense because it doesn't like fall out from a more general thing that you're doing at scale, if that makes sense. So, um, but I still think that the analogy doesn't, uh, I still don't know if it fully resonates because um, like the LMs are still pretty fallible and I still think that they have a lot of gaps and that it still needs to be filled in. And I don't think that we're getting like magical mm. generalization completely out of the box, uh, sort of in, in a certain sense. And the other aspect that I want to also actually return to when I was uh, in the in the beginning was uh, self-driving cars are nowhere near done still. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so even though, um, so the deployments still are pretty minimal. Right. Uh, so even Waymo and so on uh, has very few cars, and they're doing that roughly speaking because they're not economical, right? Um, because they've built something that uh, that lives in the future, <laughs> um, and so they they had to like pull back future, but they had had to make it uneconomical. So they have all these like um, you know, there's all these costs, not just marginal costs for those cars and mm -hmm. their operation and maintenance, but also the capex of the entire thing. Um, so making it economical is still going to be a slog, I think, uh, for them. 
if by slog you mean comparable to creating your own transport to Mars, then scaling Olympus Mons naked with no food, water, supplies or protection, then swinging by Neptune and then building a cabin on the surface of Neptune. Now, before any of you nerds go, hang on, no, wait a minute, but, but Neptune doesn't have a solid surface. That's the point, you fuckwit. Good luck to Waymo. They will need it. And then some. Waymo, without the benefit of a massive fleet for scale, huge amounts of data, had essentially had the hand force, right? They kind of had to use LiDAR to cheat their way to get some performance in some very small regions. And in doing so, were not able to develop a general solution to autonomy and are encumbered by astronomical, no pun intended, hardware costs. Now Tesla, who, by the way, just to be clear, are currently selling vehicles to consumers in the United States for, let's call it, mid $30,000 range, making a profit doing so, aka... They can produce those vehicles for call it 30,000 bucks or less, have massive scale, a massive fleet, a general solution to autonomy, meaning they can scale far and wide and put hardware on roads for a little fraction of the cost of Waymo. It's hard to see things playing out any way for Waymo other than eventually Waymo gets cut off from the teat of parent company Alphabet, aka Google. You can only lose money for so long before you just pull the plug. And then also I think when you look at these cars and there's no one driving um, I also think it's a little bit deceiving because there are actually very elaborate teleoperation centers mm. of people actually kind of like in a loop with these cars. And I don't have the I don't know the full extent of it, but I think um, there's more human in a loop that you might expect. And there's people somewhere out there, uh, basically mm. uh, beaming in from the sky. Uh, and uh, I don't actually know that they're fully in the loop with the driving. May, I think some of the times they are, but they're certainly involved, and there are people. And in some sense, we haven't actually removed the person. We've like moved them uh, to somewhere we can't see them. I still think there will be some work, as you mentioned, going from environment to environment. And uh, so I think like there's still challenges to to make self-driving real. But I, I do agree that it's definitely cross a threshold where it kind of feels real, unless it's like really teleoperated. Um, for example, Waymo can't go to all the different parts of the city. Uh, my suspicion is it's like parts of the city where you don't get a good signal. Huh. Anyway, so basically, I don't actually... Conspiracy alert. By the way, I think Andre is about to say, I don't actually know that for sure. But again, just keep in mind, this dude is an actual gigabrain. And he's apparently just hypothesized, tinfoil hat alert, that maybe the quote-unquote self-driving Waymos operating in very small pockets of, say, San Francisco are far more teleoperated than people might imagine, and perhaps even not operating in certain pockets of the city because they can't get sufficient signal to ensure seamless teleoperation. Conspiracy alert. Now, I'll let him put his caveat out there. I can see from the body language it's coming. Oh, I don't actually know that. I'm just saying. Now, I just want to jump in, though, and add a few things that I've heard. Rumors, maybe true, maybe not. What I was hearing some time ago, rumours that part of the way that Waymo vehicles were phoning home and being teleoperated wasn't necessarily having somebody actually sitting there with like a digital steering wheel controlling the vehicle from afar, but many cases where the vehicle would essentially call home and go, Daddy, I don't know what to do. Do I stay in this lane or I move here? What do I do, Daddy? Help. And Daddy would say, oh yeah, go into this lane. Very simple instruction. I also heard rumours there was a layer beyond that where there was actual literal teleoperation, e.g. somebody phoning in and controlling the vehicle exactly as opposed to giving it instructions do this do that go here go here turn there stop here blah blah blah. now clearly something like this whether you have a human supervisor in the passenger seat who if necessary can climb across and drive for a short period of time or teleoperation at some point while these things are certainly initially going to be necessary for everybody trying this very big challenge of autonomy at some point they got to go otherwise you don't have an economical business anyway back to Gigabrain here is about to throw a caveat on the tail end of his conspiracy is my best guess. I don't really know anything about the stack. I mean, I'm just making up, making up stuff. But <laughs> he, <laughs> you, you let self driving for five years at Tesla. Huh? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know anything about the specifics of Waymo. I feel oh, like yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. them. Mm-hmm. I actually, by the way, love Waymo and I take it all the time. Yeah. So I don't want to say like, sure. I just think that people again are sometimes a little bit too naive about some of the progress and I still think there's a huge amount of work. And I think Tesla took, in my mind, a lot more scalable approach. Yeah. And I think the team is doing extremely well and is going to, um, and I, I, I'm kind of like on the record for predicting how this thing will go, which is like way more like early start because you can package up so many sensors. But I do think Tesla is taking the more uh, scalable strategy and it's going to look a lot more like that. Uh, so I think this will have to still uh, play out and mm-hmm. hasn't. But basically, like, I don't want to talk about self-driving as something that took a decade because it didn't take, it didn't take yet. <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> because one, it's the, the start is at 1980, not 10 years ago. And then two, the end is not here yet. Yeah, the end is not not near yet. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, when we're talking about self-driving, usually in my mind, it's self-driving at scale. Yeah. Um, people don't have to get a driver's license, etc. For those who were just listening along and didn't actually see Andre's hand gestures when describing Waymo's early start and then going completely dead flat versus Tesla, joining the late race and then going absolutely vertical. 
I tend to agree. It's still going to take time to play out, but I just don't see a way that Waymo can compete with Tesla on scale because they don't have a general solution. But even if they could, even if that was also true, even if they could actually somehow miraculously press the magic, we have a general solution of autonomy button, which they can't and don't, they would still have two other astronomical insurmountable challenges. One, Waymo doesn't make their own vehicles. Even if Waymo had trillions of dollars to throw at other companies to produce vehicles for them, they'd still struggle to deploy their vehicles at scale. And even if they could somehow magically do that, they still wouldn't be able to put hardware, aka vehicles, on roads for a comparable cost to Tesla. I mean, they have a massive cost disadvantage at cost per mile over time. Therefore, G fucking G. My money's on Tesla. Figuratively and literally. Want more content? Early access? A bunch of perks? Click the links in the pinned comment. AG1 is awesome. I've been taking it daily now for more than three years. It's a great way to fill in nutritional gaps. It's packed full of vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients. Plus, it has prebiotics, probiotics, and adaptogens to improve gut health, regularity, and help your body handle stress. I'm always looking for an edge to help me feel and perform my best, which is why I haven't missed a day of AG1 for more than three years. Just try it and see how you feel. Click the link in the pinned comment or head to drinkag1.com slash SMR and get yourself a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five travel packs.